We're delighted to be with all of you today to talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but I, I really think I should talk to the conference organizers about following Melinda French Gates <laughs> in the panel the next day. This is a tough panel the next day. This is a tough act to follow. Yeah. But um, our goal today is to really try to incorporate you as much into this discussion as possible. So we'll, we'll talk for a little bit, and we're going to try to open up the Q&A and um, audience participation as soon as possible. Um, before we start, I just wanted to kick off this discussion by announcing an opportunity. Um, Eisenhower Fellowships is going to launch a new initiative to leverage the power and promise of the 700 women in the Eisenhower Fellowship Network. This initiative is called Igniting Future Women Leaders, and will call upon the women leaders in our network to connect, inspire, and mentor young women ages 13 to 19. If um, you're tired of hearing me say that, you must have been at the women's lunch or um, at one of the earlier sessions, but there's going to be a QR code that's going to be up on the screen. If you'd like more details about this initiative, please download the document that is a full proposal and be in touch with us. We certainly hope you'll join us um, in this effort. Um, so just to start off, let me introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, I'm sure I won't do them justice, but let me just kick it off. Um, Sarah Hackbird is the Chief Executive Officer of Women Moving Millions. Sarah is responsible for building strategy and scale around Women Moving Millions' mission for greater impact and gender equality. For more than two decades, Sarah has been contributing to nonprofit organizations that expand civil rights. And we also have with us Joyce O'Connor, Chair of the Digital Group at Institute of International and European Affairs. She's most importantly a 1989 Eisenhower Fellow and founding president of the National College of Ireland, the first woman to be appointed at the university level um, college in Ireland. Throughout her career, Professor O'Connor has championed access to education. Um, also with us, we have Mary Sue Barrett. She is a member of our Chicago Steering Committee. She's the founder of MSB Policy Consulting. And for 25 years, she was president of the Metropolitan Planning Council and served as chief of policy for Chicago. And last but, and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Dr. Siobhan, uh, uh, Siobhan, <laughs> I messed it up. Uh, Bimona, Biyokama. Uh, Biyokama. She's a 2016 Eisenhower Fellow from Rwanda, and she's currently the founder and managing partner of Shazar Associates, a consultancy firm that's focused on digital health. Previously, Siobhan was managing director of Babel Rwanda, uh, uh, which is focused on uh, creating accessible and affordable health services to all. So welcome, panelists. Um, before we start, I just also want to mention, it was actually in a, a preliminary call that I had with Sarah, where she suggested that we reach out and survey the 700 women in our network. And so one thing I would like to do as we go along this conversation is to try to weave in some of the feedback that we got from the fellows um, into the questions and the comments and the trends that we heard from the women fellows in our network. Um, so I'll actually start with Joyce. Um, <coughs> Joyce, unfortunately, one of the things I heard from these surveys that emerge repeatedly is that some of the fellow fellows that self-confidence has on them. So what would you say to your fellow fellows who expressed this challenge of, of confidence? There was one fellow who says, I'm amazing. <laughs> and, but many of the other ones did talk about you know, this issue of self-confidence and how that had, that's really um, a barrier for them. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, everybody has been very honest that self-confidence is, is an issue for women. Um, but I think the best way to address that is actually, you know, to be aware of it, let people know. And I'm a great believer in uh, having a support group around you, uh, a positive group of people not necessarily your friends or your family, but people who, for one reason or another, see the, and believe in what you are and what you do. And often it's only the small little encouragement, or it could be even bigger, but to keep in touch with that group. And one of the things I really think is important is to surround yourself by positive people, because the naysayers are plenty. The good thing about naysayers, they come in when things are good, but they leave when things are bad. So what you want around you are these people. And I think through your life, 
if you cultivate, I think you have to work at that, actually. I don't think it just comes naturally. Uh, they change, but they're so important to that self-belief and self-confidence. But I really think at the end of the day, as women, we have to work on that self-confidence ourselves. It can be hard, but we have to put that effort in and in a sense challenge ourselves at, time, at times to take a step forward, to do things and think, I'll never do that, you know, but do it and then you, it's reinforced. So it's practice, you know, it's a practice thing about it. And I suppose all these things, and we're talking to some, some of our fellows here over the week, you know, all of these things require work. You know, they don't come naturally, except for, for this one person. So I'd say it's get yourself this positive group, work on it yourself, look at the issues that you can learn from. Sometimes you'll fail, sometimes things won't work, but you'll only learn from that. And getting that feedback is so important. So it's open communication. You know, we heard a lot today and yesterday about communicating with people about being open and I think again if you have that that you know support group as I call them that you can communicate with that makes an ordinate difference. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to get back to you Sarah in a second but I'm going to hop over to Mary Sue. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's the whole forum is based on possible solutions to these issues so Let's discuss some possible solutions that contribute to greater gender e inequality, gender uh, equality. In our surveys, many of the women fellows cite specific policies in countries, um, formal programs in their organizations, informal mentoring, all being key drivers for the advancement of women. Um, not surprisingly, some mentioned the Eisenhower Fellowship, thank you very much, and other educational opportunities as integral to the professional development. What, in your view, has what, in your view, has contributed most to helping you or other women advance in their careers? Well, I was fascinating to read some of these survey results because it really echoed with my own experience and what Joyce just shared. Um, I recall when I was working for the mayor of Chicago, it was early in my career, and I was appointed the chief of policy at age 29 responsible for a team that included a bunch of people with tons more experience. So it was really needing to be intentional about working on self-confidence. I found that in every institution I've been part of or connected to in some way, there are the formal opportunities. There's a fellowship application process. There are leadership development organizations. And, and reaching for those is really important, but also the informal networks that Joyce spoke to of figuring out ways to surround yourself and then maintain those relationships, um, particularly multidisciplinary networks. Because if you are uh, a woman focused in technology, knowing that that industry association is there for you, great. But also knowing that you have a chance to connect with artists and finance people and marketing people turns out to be extraordinarily important. Um, and then something I try to apply in my own professional life, but I also tell my kids, is ask for what you need. Mm -hmm. Because it's surprising how many times you can get a yes. That's right. There was zero professional development budget in the mayor's office, zero. And there was an opportunity to apply um, for an International Women's Forum Fellowship while I was in the public sector. And, you know, it sounded very exciting. It was the second year of the program. There hadn't been someone from Chicago in the first class and some women who were older than me said, we'd like to nominate you. But there was a $5,000 application requirement. And I couldn't afford it. And there was no budget to tap. And one of those women said, oh, don't worry about it. I'll call up five women, and they'll all contribute $1,000. And that was mind-blowing to me at an early stage in my career, that people who didn't know me mm -hmm. would do that. So there are opportunities like that everywhere, everywhere we look. And I think there's encouragement. Um, both in the formal and informal networks, and I saw that echoed in the, in the survey responses. Thank you. Siobhan, maybe we can put this in the context of Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, we had talked a little bit about specific policies that you feel have supported women's advancement about that. I think I'll start from uh, what Melinda Gates said yesterday. Um, if you're developing policies, if you're, if you're doing anything for women, 
invite them to the room because they know best what is relevant for them. Um, so you create with them, not for them. Um, in the context of Rwanda, uh, there are a couple of policies, and I think I'll speak to three of them, that I think that have been created in part because the women were in the room. So we have a constitution in Rwanda that was developed in 2003, and there was women representation in there. And maybe a little bit of background. We've gone through a genocide about 29 years ago, and I think we had a population of about 7.7 .7 million people at the time, um, with a significant number of people who were in prisons as a result of that, people who had fled. So it was inevitable for women to be in every bit of the society. So back to the constitution. So in our constitution, there is a 30% representation of women in decision-making bodies. So that is any board that is regulated, you need to have 30% representation um, at grassroots levels and, and, and everything uh, and, and moving forward. And in terms of when women are at the table, let me just talk to three, um, to some of those policies. One, I'll just talk maybe about maternity leave. Uh, in Rwanda, uh, women would have three months of maternity leave. And we realized that especially small businesses were not hiring women because of the burden of employing women um, who you have to give these three man months of, of leave. And so what they, they've now done is that everybody is taxed a little bit so that you get your three months of leave, but the company can claim back from government six weeks of leave, which sort of shares the burden. So um, I think that uh, that's one of them. The second one, um, which is quite interesting, is, for example, about marriage. So in Rwanda, when you get married, you have to choose three types of regimes. You can choose at the point of marriage that I will share with my husband whatever we bring to the table, whatever you have, whatever you have, and everything we create moving forward. Or you can decide, uh, I'll keep what I have, you keep what you have, and then we can work together and own everything together. Or you can keep it separate. What that means that if I went to ask for a loan as a man or a woman, um, remember if uh, the bank will ask you to present uh, your marriage certificate. Are you single? Are you married? And you will not get a loan without the consent of your partner. Yes. Mm. So that's very critical because then that brings the woman um, uh, um, on the table. So, 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 so that is why, especially, so that is why, especially when you have things like uh, uh, women representation everywhere, you will not be surprised to find that you know, 50% uh, of our cabinet is women. Uh, we have the highest population of women in parliament in the world. I think we're over 61%. Uh, because women are engraved per constitution in representing and being part of the conversation. Yeah. Before, um, when I was preparing for the session, I noticed that Melinda French Gates wrote an article in The Economist last week. And in that, she actually was talking about if, policy, if policymakers prioritize investments in women's economic power, the global economy could grow by an additional 7% 7, 7 by 2030. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's something we, it seems like common sense, um, but I think we need to keep having the conversation yes. around that. But I, I think also, I think all these initiatives are really important because they are focusing on women. But I also think we should look at the UN sustainable goals around diversity, ESG initiatives within uh, corporations, because once you mainstream them, they will happen. I'm always concerned with um, initiatives that are, into a sense, sidelined for women. They have been very impactful. Certainly in Ireland, they've made enormous difference. By 1972, if you got married, you couldn't work in the civil service. Uh, you know, so Europe brought in a lot of um, equality legislation that was very powerful. But I think what we need to work for is, is not just gender equality, but diversity. Because what's happening now is that I think the recent research, say, in America has shown that the the number of women reaching the C-seat has, has actually improved one in four, but for people